Uh, we're thankful, Lord, for all the goodness that you bring our way. We're thankful that you work uh, through us and that uh, we can uh, do what we do for your glory. I pray your blessings upon this fast time tonight and for uh, working through Dr. Heavenless to enlighten us on this subject. We pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Do we decide we are all set in the morning with the uh, with the projector and all that? We all I am for the way you are. Good. Just be sure not to get the disc. Don't forget the disc. It's right here. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 I'll I'll stand up any moment now. <laughs> <laughs> sure feels good. Oh well. You ready? <laughs> you said let me know as we go. All right. Do we need to uh, start with any questions, or I'd rather not review the whole thing last night. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, that's where we'll end up tonight. But uh, do you have some questions where we can catch up here? Uh, Last night we discussed the uh, actually four different groups, four different movements regarding historical Jesus. First quest, no quest, second quest, third quest. We discussed method and uh, difference between reliability and minimal facts. Then we introduced criteria. And at each of these points, we were giving, um, I gave some examples, and you folks brought some examples up. And uh, of each of these uh, criteria, each criterion. And uh, we'll start with this tonight, set and did, and review a couple of the, what these rules show you. And then spend, I hope, the uh, bulk of our time on the last three because it'll take us tonight to do that. Any uh, questions or anything you thought about today or something perhaps that wasn't overly clear last night? Yes. Something that came up last night. Um, I'll avail myself of an opportunity to be corrected. Um, apologetic by definition deals with doubt. It deals with doubt or skeptics. Apologetic? Yes. So, in other words, you wouldn't, you wouldn't use this method as a basis for a ministry in the church. Although you might teach church people this, you wouldn't approach your pastoral ministry based on this kind of outline. Okay. Um, the word apologetics means defense. And that's how it's used in First Peter, you know, the chief text that I mentioned last night. And right at the end of the night, I was addressing practical uses of apologetics. And I would teach, or maybe this is the way you were asking the question, um, I would teach apologetics in the church because I think the chief value of apologetics is strengthening, strengthening believers. And... Uh, uh, I, I mentioned to you last night doing some stuff on the subject of doubt. I had a good friend who uh, suggested a book title for me one day for one of my doubt books. Of course, you folks probably know publishers give, they do their own titles by and large. But he thought he should call, he thought I should call one of the doubt books Doubt Inoculation. I thought that was cool. Now, seen from that perspective as inoculation, Apologetics is something you'd want to do in a local church to prepare your people. It's not a species of evangelism. I said that last night, but it can be used as a type of method. Now, I'm probably just waltzing around with your topic. I, I don't mean when you're preaching, you wouldn't necessarily preach from a minimal fact, you know, sort of mentality. You would, you would take, from our perspective, you would take all of the Bible and assume that your congregation also takes all of the Bible and run with the devil. Although you, oh. may, you may teach apologetics to your church. You, you, that's not going to be 
Sure. The defining mentality of your pastor. Well, let's put it this way. Oh, no, 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 absolutely not. I passed for seven years before I started teaching, so no, I wouldn't have gotten away with that. Um, but if, if I were ever doing the minimal facts method by, by presenting the resurrection, I would not tell my people I would do the minimal facts. I would just teach it because they wouldn't notice the difference. Now, watch what I'm saying. I'm not saying they wouldn't know the difference because they're dumb or because they're lay people or because they're not studying apologetics. That's not my reason. But anytime you take any topic, you have to be selective, right? If you're preaching on whatever, whatever you're preaching on, you have to be selective. So as far as the people who hear me teach on the resurrection, they'll lecture you, you folks here tomorrow, Lord willing. It's a lecture I've given. The general lecture on the resurrection I've probably given more than a thousand times. It's almost always in, in churches. But I won't tell them so much about what method I'm doing, because they know I have to be selective when I'm doing the resurrection, because the resurrection is way too large a topic. So what I select are the best evidence data. So they'll just get the best evidence data without me even telling them I'm putting, you know what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah. Of the 20 evidences I could pick, I might pick six. Well, those six are also consistent with the minimal facts argument. Because if I'm going to pick the best arguments, I'm going to pick the minimum facts data because they are the best attested. That's why atheists can see them. So all that, does that help a little bit? It does. I mean, we're on the same page. I just thought it might be good to get right. clarification. Yeah. And I would teach apologetics in the church the way I would teach other areas in the church. It would be one of many things church people should be exposed to. Okay. Yes. Uh, you were going over some of the uh, practical uses, and you, you named a few. Um, would you review those and talk a little bit about how important this is for loving God with our mind and, and the concept of and even how it comes into a very spiritual act of worship and, and appreciating? Yeah, let's take it a step further. Last time when this was over, um, you, you may recall I gave three purposes. Well, actually, I didn't even get to the third one. I just realized that. Um, if somebody said, what's the value of apologetics? I would say apologetics does three things. And I'm not giving you a definition. I'm just telling you now that we get past definition, how, what does it do? I would say, and this is the first one I mentioned last night, apologetics is worth its weight in gold if all it does is strengthen believers and presents them with a basis so that they, for example, when they go away to school, or when their kids go away to school, they, they're not one of the, in surveys, they're not one of the 10 to 30% casualties who walk away from their Christianity. Uh, tonight, coming over here in the, in the car, uh, Scott and I were talking about... Um, a number of well-known historical Jesus people today who are way down on the left-hand side of things, but they used to be evangelicals. Uh, Bart Ehrman in North Carolina, who went to Moody Bible Institute and is a Wheaton grad. And I believe he called himself an agnostic today. Um, there's a number of people like that. I can just start giving you names, but they're a number First thing I think apologetics does is it gives believers a basis for what they believe. And it keeps them... I like 1 Corinthians 15, 58. First thing Paul says is, therefore, because Jesus has been raised from the dead, very first thing is, be firm and steadfast. Remain steadfast. I think apologetics is not the only thing. It's not the only stay dead fast to discipline but it's certainly one of them secondly and I used the example last night of the search ministries I think apologetics can be used in the power of the Holy Spirit and I want to be real clear about this no matter how good your argument is no matter how good your argument is um, nobody is going to come to Christ because you powered them into the kingdom there is no such thing in my opinion there's no such thing as powering somebody in the kingdom. Regeneration is a work of the Holy Spirit. 
you can, it's the old saying, you can lead them to the water, but you can't make them drink. I, I'll tell you, when you go to, uh, we ended last night talking about secular campuses. When people come down to talk, generally, or if you, if you hang around guys like Bill Craig or J.P. Morton, they're almost, nobody's ever going to get to first base with them, challenging what they have to say on, on the arguments. But that doesn't mean the person is even one step closer to coming to Christ. It's not hard to win these kind of arguments with skeptics. They just they don't have the data. I'm not saying they're stupid. They just don't have the data. And you can win an argument and the person not be one step closer to becoming a Christian. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit can use that message and break down some of their boundaries. And I didn't tell you this last night. Search does not keep statistics on how many people actually come to the Lord through their use of apologetics. They combine apologetics and friendship evangelism. But they said, they, I heard some specific cases, um, some really, really neat stories, that thousands of men have come to the Lord through their, their apologetics. That's the second use. Where it is a species of evangelism, that's just not all apologetics is. Thirdly, I think apologetics helps us, helps us to tell the world we have an answer, even when they don't want to hear that answer. Francis Schaeffer said, if this generation does not know there's answers, the next generation will think there are none. So the third reason I think apologetics is good is, it gives the gospel and gives reasons, even to those who claim they don't want reasons and don't give a rip. It just lets them register in the back of their mind. There are Christians running around who want to talk about evidence. It's not a, it's not a leap of faith. So I think those are the three things apologetics does. I put first on my list is that it strengthens believers, makes them firm and steadfast. Secondly, by the grace of the Holy Spirit, people do come. And by the way, that second category, sometimes apologetics doesn't lead the person all the way there. But it breaks down the barriers, and they visit a church three weeks later, and they become Christians. Do you ever know of any people who have real brilliant people who have really good objections? And when their objections are broken down, you'll say, how did you come to the Lord? Oh, I wandered into this church. You're thinking, wandered into this church baloney. I know what you were doing for five years. You would have come close to a church. But when, the do- when, when, their, when their basis is taken out from under them, when their objections are knocked down, it's often the four spiritual laws that lead to the Lord. I had a stu- we had a student, the guy now has a PhD from uh, Princeton, but he was attending a state university studying religion. You can imagine what that was like. And he started reading uh, a Christian philosopher. And the guy broke down all his barriers, but he wasn't a Christian. And one day, he said to his wife, hey, why don't we visit that Baptist church right up there at the end of our street? There's a revival going on. Why don't we just see what it's about? And they became Christians. But see, he's been, he'd been reading this philosopher that had broken down his walls. So I think sometimes it's that two-step kind of thing. Answer your objections, and then, you know, you're ready for the gospel. But thirdly, I really do think people need to hear, even if they don't, even if they don't know if there's if they don't want to hear answers, they need to hear there are answers. Now, that's the summary that Cyrus asked about, but he made a good point last night when he came up and he said, Cyrus, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Did you say something like, I would have said, you didn't say, I, 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 wasn't, I didn't mean that like you were trying to, you were going, no, 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 no. Okay, you said, if I were answering that question about how it does, did you say, in my mind, it's just something like, I would have said, I pursue apologetics because I have to to love God with my mind. Did I sell the book? Yeah, that was definitely a part of it. And I, and I, and I, first thing I said to him was, did you read J.P. Morgan's book, Loving God with All Your Mind? And he said, he's working through it, right, or something like that? Yeah, I, I think, I take that as a next step after apologetics, but I would say, and I'm, I'm working really hard at this, I've been working on this for about 15 years. 
But my question is this. If we have truth, what manner of persons ought we to be? How do people who have truth behave? How do they believe? What do they choose? What does their will look like? Um, here's a good question. If you really, really believe Christianity is true, what does your private walk with the Lord look like? Now, I wouldn't say that's one thing apologetics does. I mean, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't list that as four things. You know, strengthen believers, lead on believers by the power of the Holy Spirit, give answers to those who aren't working, uh, aren't listening, and straighten out the spiritual life. I think that's really stretching, because I really don't think apologetics, I think it could move that way. I think it should move that way. But there's nothing in apologetics that does that. You could just as well say, I was studying the Old Testament, and that happened. I was studying, the, you know, the church, and that happened. But I do think if you're convinced something's true, you should move in the direction of being sold out to it. You should, you should, there should be a path to loving God with all your mind. And personally, if you say, what would that path look like? I would say it should act in a specific direction with your personal uh, quiet time. It should have personal direction with the disciplines. Are the disciplines big out here? They are on our side of the country. Because I haven't seen the light go on. You know what I mean? But Dallas Willard, Richard Foster, not too big, just a little. Our whole church, the church I attend and worship at, our whole church is built on the uh, disciplines. In fact, I teasingly say this, you guys know who Dallas Willard is? You know? Boy, he's getting close to his home out here. There's no discipline in Oregon. Pardon? There's no discipline in Oregon. No discipline in Oregon? Well, he's in California. He really does. He is a professor of philosophy at USC. For a while, he was even department head. Uh, J.P. Moreland tells me, in J.P.'s opinion, uh, Dallas Willard is the most accomplished philosopher he knows, the best technician he knows. So Dallas Willard is very good in his subject, and yet he's written several books on the disciplines. Um, I'm, I'm sure Jay would say he's the guy that really <coughs> moved him. You guys know who Richard Foster is? Right? Okay. Dallas Willard was Richard Foster's professor. So Willard got Foster going. And the chief idea behind the disciplines is when you ask believers, so what do you do in your quiet time? And the person says, or, or maybe not in your quiet time, just in your practical Christian life. And the person says, well, you know, the big five, I uh, read the Bible and uh, I pray. And, you know, it's kind of halting when you're doing it. Say, so, um, I worship and I witness, and I give. Those are disciplines. Well, the, one of the main ideas about the discipline movement is classic Christianity in the New Testament, even Old Testament, New Testament sense. That list is about 20. And why do we only pursue the big five? You know, reading the Bible, praying, witnessing, worshiping, and giving. Um, or if you say to somebody today, well, you know, in New Testament times, when they prayed, frequently they were into fasting, too. Well, that's not too popular for Americans, right? Um, and there's other disciplines that are very, very closely attached to those. But I would think, to me, I think it's a, a direct line from, if it's true, what are you doing about it? Now, it's not apologetics. It's spirituality. But knowing it's true should lead you to spirituality. I, was, I uh, have a group of guys I deal with from time to time, and they're seekers, skeptics, agnostics. We don't debate. I mean, I talk with them one-on-one -on, -one on the phone or over dinner, and it's not debating about what's true. It's answering their questions, and I pray that these 
guys are coming to the Lord. I was meeting with one about a week ago, and he said, can I ask you something? So I was raised in a Baptist church. He said, you know what really bothers me about Baptists? I was raised in a Baptist church, too. I said, what bothers you? He said, the Christians that I know are not very good imitators of Jesus. Now, this is going to lead me to something tonight under Dewey. So, I'll hold off on this a little bit. But he said, he said, I understand where they say our doctrine is like Jesus' doctrine. We're like that. But this guy said, but Jesus healed the sick, he fed the poor, he told us to visit people who were in prison, and the, his disciples tell us to visit the fatherless and the widows, and that that's pure religion. And he said, here's how I see Baptists. He may have extended it to Christians later, but he said, they agree with Jesus about making God first in your life or coming to Christ. I don't know what language he used. He said, but after that, the Christians I know, he said, they're all about getting rich, making a name for themselves, living in the biggest house. He said, as far as I can tell, there's no difference between Christians and non-Christians in the world except the name and the name of Jesus. He said, after that, they don't look like Jesus at all. Now realize, this guy's a seeker. And he's not telling me, I can't prove the resurrection. You know what he says to me? He says, I'll give you the resurrection. The evidence is good. It's a given. But how come Christians just can't live it? So, with Cyrus's question here, I think there should be a bridge between knowing it's true and doing something about it. I'll tell you folks something. Most doubt, most people who fall away, I'm not going to hardly define that. When, when you do these one survey, 90% of young people walked away from their faith and they went, went away to college. 90% of Christian young people. I, I used to think that knowing apologetics and having your arguments down was the number one way to stay out of harm's way. I would now say, that was 30 years ago, that was my conclusion 30 years ago. 30 years later, I'd say it this way. Apologetics, good apologetics slash good theology, uh, good church history, those, those heady disciplines that lay the foundations for what we believe, I would say they are necessary, but they are not sufficient to keep you from sliding away. I think the most important single thing you can do is to develop a relationship with the Lord. So all I can tell you about apologetics, and I wish I could say, Cyrus's comment, I wish I could say, apologetics does that for you. I don't really think it does. I just think it clears, clears the way so you can do it. Our good theology, what's good theology do? Clears the way so you can do that. What's good church history do? What's good exegetical studies do? Clears the way so you can walk the walk and talk the talk. I'll talk about that in a few minutes under the did thing. Okay? Anybody else? I thought he made a really good point when he came up and he said, I would say apologetics helps me to love God with all my mind. We need to get there. We need to build that bridge. Because too many people, they know the right answers, and then they don't take the right steps. And I wonder, when we know the right answers, how come we can't captivate our wills? And how come we can't make right choices, do the things we ought to do, and think the way we ought to think? Got some ideas about that. But I used to think, if the guy just knows apologetics, he'll have everything he needs. And I now think the answer to that is, eh. It's necessary, but it won't help you unless you start building those bridges. And then, you'll be untouchable. That, I think it's that combination of knowing it and practicing it. Anybody else? All right, I'm going to raise this right side. You folks, um... Whoa! Okay. You folks pretty much up on... Uh, you, can, you remember this list okay? So we can move on. All right. Now I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do under what Jesus said and what Jesus did. Is assume this basis... 
of critical criteria. And I'm going to mention a few things I did last night, but also mention a, a couple of new things in each category. All right? So, Carl, how's that color looking okay? All right. All right. What did Jesus say? Well, let me just review a few things with you. My example of last night when we were doing the criteria. Certainly, one of the sorts of things we know about what Jesus did, because they pass one or more of these tests, thinking the way critics think. Um, one thing we know about Jesus is that he had conflict with the religious leaders of his day. So there was some conflict in his teachings. Right? One of the categories is enemy attestation. Okay. I'm just this this part to review. Okay, secondly, I gave an example last night. Resurrection of the body. Anybody remember the uh, this example came from John Meyer, the uh, moderate historical Jesus scholar. Do you remember the example I used? Do you remember which rule he was using to make this point? Jesus believed in the resurrection of the dead. <coughs> Cyrus, you. Isn't it not coherence? Coherence. Do you remember the point he was making? That one source, he wasn't too sure about one source, but it was similar to a source that he was more confident in, so it persuaded him. Right. The one he was more sure about is the so-called Q saying in uh, Matthew 8. Many will come from the east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the kingdom of God. And so when he got to the Pharisees' question, which also is a little bit of this, when he got to the Pharisees' question, whose wife will she be in the resurrection? He said, well, that sounds like a Sadducee question. But that also, Jesus' answer sounds like the Q answer. So by coherence, he'd say we know some things about the resurrection of the body. Here's what we didn't talk much about last night. The parables are hot items today. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of agreement that the parables meet this criteria that we were given of Jesus. The parables meet the criteria. Um, can you think of some reasons why? This may not be real obvious. Why do you think the parables look like they fulfill when the, when the Bible says he didn't say anything except by speaking parables? And that, that they were that <coughs> pervasive in the ministry of Jesus. Why do you think that is? I mean, I'm not asking the question of why I use parables. I'm asking the question, how are parables established by critical criteria? Do they, they fit some of the... If the parables are meant to reflect their life, did they fit what was their life? They did fit life. They're short. One of the major criteria for... Um, one of the main ideas behind the criteria is that Jesus spoke in picturesque language, told stories, and tried to get in and out of points briefly so people could keep that whole little idea in their mind without having to do a 16-point systematic theology in their mind. But you know why? This is where sociology and anthropology, first century and socio sociology and anthropology, which are big hitters in the third quest of the historical Jesus, does anybody know what's behind saying Jesus was a parable teller? This may shock you, you've never heard the stat before. About 80 to 90 percent of Jesus' listeners were illiterate. That's not what we usually teach in church. <clears throat> How many times have you heard people say, all the guys went to school, <clears throat> and some of the women picked it up at home? However, that the guys were required to go to synagogue and the guys were required to. I don't know where we got that. Or we think most Jews could read and write. 
From what they can tell today, most could not. Maybe as high as 90% of Jesus' listeners are illiterate. Now let me ask you, if you're going to change the teachings of the Sadducees and the Pharisees, if you're going to go out there and establish yourself, and you're going to witness to and teach lay people, what do you do when they can't read and write? Pardon? You what? You tell them a story. You tell them a story. And you don't have to read and write to remember a story. Just watch how people pass jokes around today. Or what's in the power of a political cartoon? I'll have to tell you about that recently, right? We capture ideas more easily than we can capture 16-point sermons. And so parables are integral to what Jesus did because people could walk away with these stories and not be able to read them or write them. That's kind of a neat insight. All right, these are some little things that, well, parables are a huge subject, but the way I do it, I don't develop it a lot more. Let me tell you two large categories what Jesus said. One is theological, one is ethical. There are very, very few exceptions to this next statement. But most critical scholars today think Jesus' central message was what? Anybody want to take a shot? His central message. Ethical. You know, ethical is always going to be popular, right? Because the conservatives will do what Jesus teach, what Jesus taught, and the liberals... Many times, liberal theology is all about ethics. Right? They wonder why evangelicals don't take firewood to the widows in the wintertime and why we're not more active getting, you know, for social causes. I'll come to that in a second. Anybody know his chief theological teaching? The first one I want to talk about, what did Jesus say? Is theological. What was his central message? By the way, even if you put ethical in the mix, this one is closer to the center. With very few exceptions. Until the Jesus Seminar, there were virtually no exceptions. That everybody would say, there's a basic answer to this. Jesus' central teaching was, and no matter how far you were over on the left, you'd answer it the same way. Anybody know? You must, okay. Um, that's what you have to do. But what is this place that you want to... Okay, here's the way... We say heaven, and we say be born again. Here's the way critical scholars unpack it. And i got to admit, if you go back and count, if you just want to count, the Gospels do it the way the critics do, way more than they do it our way. Here's the number one message of Jesus, the most important message of Jesus. kingdom of God and we say how to get there. The kingdom of God and its interest requirements. If there's a kingdom, I want to know how to get into the kingdom. Right? That's Jesus' number one message. There's a kingdom. And there's a path into that kingdom. Now the born again language you find in John 3. Jesus, uh, J- uh, John uses kingdom of God language too. In the synoptics, it's almost always kingdom of God. <clears throat> With this one footnote. Matthew calls it what? Kingdom of, heaven. kingdom of heaven. And contrary to what you might hear from some from interesting dispensational uh, I think twistings of what the difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. I think it's pretty clear that there's no difference, no appreciable difference in the synoptics. In fact, in Mark 9, in some of these texts, it's clear that Jesus uses the kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God interchangeably. Does anybody know why it's thought by scholars that Matthew uses kingdom of heaven while the others say kingdom of God? Pardon? 
Yep. Matthew had a Jewish audience, and Jews what? Look toward heaven. Pardon? Well, what about saying kingdom of God? What about saying kingdom of heaven? They would shy away from using the proper name for God. And kingdom of heaven would allow them to talk about the place without talking about the title. But, but there are texts where Jesus uses the two interchangeably. But critics, can you imagine this? Not evangelical to tell you that's Jesus' central teaching. All you have to do is listen to, listen to the I came to verses. I came to seek and to save that which is lost. I came that you might have life, you might have more abundantly. I came not to call righteous but sinners to repentance. I came to give my life a ransom for many. The I came to. If you're the Son of God, and this isn't your home, you had to come here for a reason. What is it? He always answers in terms of bringing them something, doing something for them that they can't do for themselves, bringing them a key to get into a kingdom where they previously were shaky on the kingdom and certainly didn't know about the key. But he's coming to, he's coming to give them the offering them a key. Because he says, now in John, he uses language like this. I'm the way, the truth, and life. Where, where's the key? You're looking at him. Well, show me the Father. He that's seen me has seen the Father. That's the way John says it. But the synoptics isn't that... The synoptics use different... They, there's different... You know, if you tell a story, if someone else tells a story, you can tell the story two different ways, and the theme can be exactly the same. Right? Especially if you're a Baptist and your friend's are Wesley. Right? There's just a little different way you say the words, but you mean the same thing. Well, the synoptics, I, I puzzled over this for a long time. Why does John use born again language, I am language? By the way, we'll see under himself tonight that John is not the only place where we have the ego and mean language. I would like you to think for, for a little bit later. What is, if you want to, if a critic asks you, where does Jesus claim to be somebody special? Where does Jesus claim to be the Son of God? Where do you go? Now, just let you think about that and then let you double track, okay? Because I do want you to hear what I'm saying now. So, later, I want you to tell me where you would take that. Who do you say that I am? Matthew 16. But what text do you think gets your point across the best? All right, come back to that later. But there's I am language. In fact, I'm going to argue that the best, the strongest I am language is not even the Gospel of John. That may make you think. If it makes you think, that's great. Okay. So, so in John, it's you must be born again. He that's seen me has seen the Father. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is much more overt. But in the synoptics, he talks like this. I want you to take up your cross and follow me. And I want you to prefer me above your husbands and your wives, and above your children, and above your fathers, and your mother, and your whole family. I want you to, you know, put me first in your life. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, Matthew says. And take up your cross and follow me. And don't even try to gain your own life. But seek mine, and yours will get thrown in. That's the way he talks in synoptics. Now, what's the difference between those two? There's not... You know what they both have in common? What they both have in common is... And by the way, John does use kingdom of God. But what they both have in common is Jesus is initiating the kingdom. He's the king, and he holds the keys. That's what they both have in common. And you come his way, or you come no way. That's pretty exciting, isn't it? I mean, depending on how you dress us up, this would fly in a Baptist church, or a Wesleyan church, or whatever. But it's not the Baptists or the Wesleyans that are answering this question. It's the, quote, liberals. Small L. That's Jesus' major message, they're going to say. That's his major message. And, this might surprise you, Critical scholars, including Ray, uh, uh, Rudolf Boltmann, 
to go back to last night, Rudolf Boltmann and one of his chief interpreters slash translators, Reginald Fuller, a lot of guys, almost a, Gunter Bornkamp, one of the major Second Quest guys who wrote Jesus of Nazareth, they're all going to say this. Jesus was convinced. These are critics. Down in, you know, we're talking D plus to F plus, you know, on our scale from last night. They're going to say, Jesus placed himself in the place of God. And Jesus taught that what you do with me determines where you spend eternity. That's not John's language. That's more synoptic language. But I don't see John have any problem with that at all. Isn't it amazing? Boltman thought that. Fuller thought that. That Jesus taught that what you do with me determines where you spend eternity. That's not born again language that a Baptist might use, but that, that's good theology. That's Jesus' major teaching. Now, let me just give you two sub points here. Folks, well, you know, one thing that really bothers me. I'm assuming, Dr. House, that uh, inerrancy is in the faith seminary statement. You, you know what kills me about a lot of Christian seminaries and churches? Is that we can affirm inerrancy, and so we get all over somebody who doesn't believe in inerrancy. But what do inerrantists do when they don't like text? When liberals don't like text, they say, you know, that's for you, that's not for me. Or, here's the class, here's, here's the trickier way of saying it. I don't really think Jesus taught that. Well, it's right here in Matthew. <laughs> right. Matthew says that. I don't think Jesus taught Don't divorce what the text says from what Jesus said, right? And you'll say, ah, they're just sweeping it under the carpet because they don't believe that. All right. Let's ask about evangelicals who believe in inerrancy. What do we do with texts that we don't like, even though we believe in inerrancy? I, I think the same thing. We believe that everything the Bible says, now you know there are exceptions. What I mean by that is sometimes the Bible is reporting the lives of Satan or uh, Adam and Eve's fall or the lives of Ananias and Sapphira or the Son. But by and large, when the Bible affirms something, it's affirming it as fact. Even in the case of Satan, it's affirming that Satan holds those views, right? And so we say, the whole book, nothing but the book. We accept it all. What happens when it teaches something that this doesn't fit with our church, our denomination, our... It's like... I believe in inerrancy, but this just doesn't fit the right system anywhere. And so what's the difference? All right, I'm going to give you the first... I have a couple examples here to give you tonight. Here's the first one. When I say kingdom to you, what do you think in terms of timing... When does the kingdom start? Is that where it starts? Just tell me, Nate. Stacy. Stacy. Do you guys agree with Stacy? The kingdom starts when. I don't know what words you're on. When you, uh, when you uh, join and you have a relationship with Christ? So the kingdom may start for you on March 2nd, 1978. But it comes at a time, right? And it enters everybody's life in a different way. Okay. You guys agree with that? Let me ask. Some of you may, use, may, may not want to just waltz out here and answer my question. I mean, but there is a future of a bodily entering in. I mean, there is right. an option now that there is a bodily Okay. Okay. Do you have a view on which is which takes precedent? Which one is which one is emphasized when the teaching of Jesus? Present aspect or future aspect? When Jesus talks about the kingdom, is it mostly a present thing in his day and time or a future thing? Future. Who said that? Future. When you think of kingdom, what do you think of? I mean, the little kingdom that, you know, I still right now, and 
mindset that when you're looking at the Gospels, the kingdom of God is the kingdom of heaven is Matthew referred to. It's dispensationalist, you know, going back to what you were talking about earlier, I'm going to say the kingdom of God is, and what I believe meant the Jews at that time uh, was not, not uh, a spiritual uh, third heaven as much as it was a earthly rule of the kingdom. That's what I think it was. So what does it start? It, <clears throat> It, it starts with the, uh, the second half of the cross. Is when we start. So it's mostly futuristic on this view. Uh, is faith seminary dispensational or not? It is. Okay. Yeah. Now, if you guys are like us, faculty members sign the statements, but students don't have to. So we have a variety of students. In fact, you may not know this, but you don't have to be a Christian to go to Liberty University. We, I don't know what our percentage is. We probably have 5%. I know the last year I coached ice hockey, one of the stars on my team was a Buddhist. <laughs> and I know he had to ride, he was from uh, Calgary, Alberta. He drove home for Christmas break with one of the other players on my team who was from Calgary. The other player he drove home with has a PhD right now, and is a professor of Prairie uh, Bible College up there. And the Buddhist got two years full all the way from Lynchburg, Virginia to, to Calgary, Alberta. If you know anything about that trip, it's a long drive. And the one guy just wore out the other guy. I heard the story later. It was crazy. It could have be a Christian go. But I'm... Uh, it, it, so as soon as I to sign a case, I don't know, I'm, I don't, I'm not going to assume anything about you folks as students. But I think you're right. Both you, both you guys, I think you're right to this extent. When most evangelicals hear kingdom, they think future. In some regard, they might think millennium, they might think heaven, they might, then they might start racing a little bit, they might start thinking about pre-trip, post-trip, oh no, no, that, that's rap, oh okay, it's tribulation, all right, well, millennium, you know, and they start doing that stuff, but when the one always answers have a problem is, it's future. All right, now before I kind of make some comments here about what Jesus said, uh, anybody else? Well, the kingdom of God is within you, and there it begins in the present in this life. Well, how, how, let's just look at a few of those verses. Don't look here or there. The kingdom of God is within you, or among you. Okay, how about this one? If I, by the finger of God, cast out demons, then know that the kingdom has, has already come. That's a true statement, by the way, in Luke and Matthew. So, you know, critics are going to jump up there and go, oh, this is early. This is early. If I, by the finger of God, cast out demons, the kingdom of God's already arrived. What's the opening verse say? Anybody know the opening verse in Mark 1? Oh, let me back up. There's a little quiz time here. How many Gospels say anything about the childhood of Jesus? Or how many Gospels talk about the birth of Jesus? How many? Luke does? What else? There's one more. Matthew. Mark does not and John does not. But Mark starts out with, his, with John and with his preaching. And do you remember the opening comment? What's Jesus, what, what's the message he begins with? I think it's Mark 1, 15. I mean, he gets right there. 15 verses into the gospel, we're already there. Go ahead, if, you, if one of you found it, go ahead and check the out. I think it's 115. The time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. His opening message is, time's up, it's right here. Whoa. Don't, don't. You're talking about the living, aren't you? Now his opening message is, boom, it's here. So you got verses like Mark 1.15, kingdom of God is within, or among you, depending on which guy you're reading this. If I buy the finger of God, cast out demons, the kingdom of God is already. Now there's also the future ones, right? There's a whole, whole list of them in Mark 9. Pluck out your eye, cut it, you know, because you... Because if any of you, uh, you know, if that keeps you from entering the kingdom, it sounds like it's a future thing, right? 
Anybody else want to throw in here? I, here's, I, I think... Go ahead. I'm just going to make a, a comment about where I think most evangelicals are today. So there's no way to know that exactly. I just, I'll just tell you the feeling I got when I heard kingdom preaching when I was growing up. I think evangelicals almost always, their first thought is future. Okay, I want to ask you guys your view. Let's take a quick survey. You can speak for anybody you know. Your church, your pastor's preaching, your last pastor's preaching. Do you think it's predominant among evangelicals that when they hear kingdom of God, they think future? Yes. Or do they think present? How many of you think evangelicals think future first? Future first. Okay, almost all of you. How many of you think it's present first? You were raised with present first? That's rare. That's right. So three of you said present first, and everybody else said future first. Okay. And now this this is a good topic. Dallas Willard has a whole series of lectures. I think I think I got the book on my shelf, and I haven't read it yet. I really want to read it. It's a book on the kingdom. I believe he's got chapters on the manifestation of the kingdom through the Old Testament economy before it so he's got old Jesus eschatology. So you could go three. All right. Jesus primarily uses the kingdom in two senses. All right, I'm going to discuss this so far. That's in, that didn't surprise you. Anybody want to guess which one he talks about more frequently? If you just do a verse count? It's a hot topic today. Not hot because people disagree. There's a lot of agreement among theologians, but hot because they think this is number one teaching. Sorry? It's not because it's about the future. Just first part. Yeah, just first According to Beasley Murray, the British theologian, Baptist, by the way, who has written a major work, critics. He's, mo- he's moderate to conservative, but the critics really like this book, published by Urban's. He said he takes all the verses in the kingdom. Never realized how much Jesus talked about the kingdom. There are just so many texts. Beasley Murray argues Jesus talked about the present more than he teaches about the future. Now, see, a couple of you are saying yes, but that's not the predominant view. It's not the way I was raised. So I go back. This is just. I, I'll just put this on the table. We, this is a historical Jesus course, so we're not talking about inerrancy here. But I just wonder, what do we do with texts that don't fit our scheme? It's like, <laughs> but I believe in inerrancy. Yeah, but I'd rather not talk about this. I don't remember if he talks about percentages, but he says clearly. I have them lined. Oh, it's not the book I required. I have a, um, remember I told you I go by colors? I have a, an orange book called... Uh, the Risen Jesus and Future Hope as a chapter on the Kingdom of God. It's an argument from the from the resurrection to heaven. Anyway, I I line up the verses and I give a whole list of present and future. You know, that this raises a good question. What starts the kingdom? Then I'm not talking about its Old Testament preparation, but what starts the kingdom? Now, see, most Christians are going to go uh, when the millennium starts. Uh, when the millennium is over and heaven starts? I think most Christians are doing that. That's how I would have answered it. Go ahead. Purpose is defining the kingdom. I mean, what do you mean by kingdom? In other words, here, it, I, I, you know, uh, uh, first of all, I, I have to take a look and see, you know, how is uh, kingdom used, you know, among us? What's the word? I mean, you know, an engineering study of what among us is. It may be that on its face in, in English translation. It doesn't, I guess it just don't conflict the present and future kingdom. I, there's no com- I don't think there's any conflict at all. Don't, don't get what I'm saying that. And, and so that the, the principle of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven, the millennial kingdom, I, you know, I believe, as I understand at this point, yeah, many years of study left, uh, really is the, the focus of Christ. Even though he may be speaking in present tense, in present terms, uh, then what is he speaking about in heaven? My concern about present terms is, is you know, it's a bit more existential. I have to worry about this idea of the present kingdom of God, because the kingdom of God is among you, or worship in you. Uh, that idea that you 
Uh, that is a center of the kingdom of heaven. Yeah, I don't think that's where Jesus' emphasis was. It's not, it's not on the you. That's right. But my concern would be that, that when you start looking at a president's tax kingdom of heaven, that might be the case. But you, like you said, you can't dismiss it. You have to accept it. And then once you accept it, you know, we, we can have to say, what was he trying to say consistent with the message of Christ? What does kingdom mean? Basileia. What does the word kingdom mean? It's, it's the rulership of God. Pardon? The realm or rule. And guess what started it? If you read only Jesus' comments, you don't put it in any other, you don't try to have any other eschatological, just, just read what Jesus said. The present aspect only, and there is no conflict whatsoever between these two. Present conflict, the present, present conflict, present manifestation of the preaching is manifest in the presence of Jesus and his preaching. Phase one, now Old Testament you got preparation. Phase one of its actually arriving is synonymous with his person and preaching. And the future phase is it's kicking in for eternity. Well, now, in John, you know, the idea of the pill life is pill life is existing now. That's correct. And then that may be the presence of the tax kingdom of God. Kingdom, okay, when, when I, when there's the physical kingdom, maybe, and there's the spiritual kingdom. That's know, what? And, and in the spiritual kingdom, it's present tense. It is, as Stacy said, the kingdom of God exists when I become a believer, because at that time I have eternal life. You know, That's correct. The rule of God. And then, the future kingdom, the earthly kingdom, uh, which I equate more with the concept of the kingdom, with it really breaking in full time, let's say, is the future aspect. But the present tense, you might want to say, I know Trevor Jock does this a lot, I, um, you might want to say it's more spiritual because it dawns in the hearts of those who say yes to Jesus. But phase one, the present phase, is when Jesus preaches, casts out demons, if I by the finger of God cast out demons. Anyway, I'm making two points here all at once. We're saying, what did Jesus say? Most critics believe it was his central teaching. There are two aspects to it, present and future. He inaugurated the present, which leads, which, inaugurating the present gives you keys to the future. I don't know if you can say it that way. I guess that works. Inaugurating the present initiates, gives you keys when the second phase is revealed. It's a pretty neat study in Scripture. The earthly Jesus before the cross, his number one message was the kingdom of God and how to get there. After he dies, and he comes back and discusses, talks to the disciples, guess what he's talking to them about? It's Acts 1-3, by the way. It's the only text that tells us how long Jesus was on the earth after the crucifixion. That's the 40 days passage. A lot of things in that verse. Acts 1-3. He showed himself alive after his passion. The old King James says, showed himself alive by many infallible proofs. That, that's one Greek word. And it's the only time it's used in the New Testament. And it's Aristotle's. Aristotle has a hierarchy of Proofs. It's Aristotle's highest. It's Aristotle's highest term for evidence. Luke says Jesus showed himself alive with the highest level of evidence you can get. And isn't it cool? He uses Aristotle's term for the highest evidence. Luke is a Greek scholar and chooses a term. I'm not saying he chose a term from Aristotle. Who knows if he knew Aristotle? Aristotle was not read very much at this time. But he's using a term that's used by Aristotle as the highest kind of evidence you can get. All of Acts 1 3. He showed himself alive after his passion. He, pre he presented indisputable proof. He showed himself alive for 40 days and taught things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So, even the post resurrection of Jesus, this is still his main message. And how, what if I said, what if I said to you, 
Man, I, I'll literally just stop and, and explore some of these things with you. I'm losing my time tonight. And I think it'll all be down at the bottom. So I'm going to race through this one. What if I say to you, the post-ascension Jesus is still about the kingdom. His major message is still the kingdom of God. Would you draw a blank or would you... Where, where do you know about the post-ascension Jesus preaching the kingdom? Pre-ascension Jesus? That's this. After his death, before his ascension? Pre-crucifixion Jesus is this. Post-crucifixion, pre-ascension is Acts 1-3, still teaching about the kingdom for 40 days. And then when he calls Paul, which most critics date in about two years after the cross, he calls Paul to be a, a missionary to the Gentiles, that now the Gentiles may be invited into the kingdom. He anoints Paul to carry that ministry on. It's still about the kingdom. It's this one topic message. It's really neat. It begins with when we say yes to the Lord. I like that about what Stacy said. It seems to be in Scripture when you are confronted with the preaching. So you might, you might, I don't know how good this will work out. Maybe phase one is kind of piecemeal. It's when people come in as individuals. But later, the future aspect, it's just there. It's, it's existence. But we don't talk about this. The, well, the second point I'm trying to get at, I'm going to try to give you one of his major teachings. But we've got to sweep this one under the table, because we don't like the among you, here now kind of preaching. It doesn't fit our systems. Now, some of you, maybe it did. Some of you said, yeah, you learned that. I, I don't think that's the majority evangelical view, although I think that's the proper view. One more thing where we can kind of shovel things under the table, but who's right on this, you know, liberal say, it's all about loving others. And evangelicals say, it's what you've done with Christ. You know, the doors to the kingdom. Luke chapter 10, 25 to 37, a lawyer... Let me remind you, lawyer here does not mean a lawyer, like we use the word. Lawyer means a theologian. Right? A lawyer is an expert in the law. Uh, maybe I, I shouldn't even say a, 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 a theologian. Maybe I should say an exegete. This guy's a professor type. right? And he's coming to Jesus and he says, What should I do that I should gain eternal life? Now, this is reported in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And depending on which passage when you're reading, Jesus gives him the answer. Or Jesus asks him, How do you read the law and the, how do you read the Old Testament? And either Jesus is leading him to the answer or Jesus gives him the answer. But anyway, this is the famous passage where Jesus says, the first command. And he only numbers them in Matthew and Mark. He numbers them. But you'll see where I'm going to look here in a minute. The first command is this. To love the Lord your God, body, heart, soul, strength, and mind. And the second command is like the first. What is it? Okay, love your neighbor as yourself. And he says these are the two greatest commands. Which one do you think evangelicals major in? One or two? One. Which one do liberals major in? Two. Can we get our act together here? What's going on? In John, two becomes one. You know, the new commandment, you know, which is to love your neighbors, uh, you know, is uh, I can love you. That, that, uh, that John 15, 1 John 2, 1 John 3. John 15 and... That it, it comes from circle in John. Yeah. But, 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 so I well, I think that's good. Let me come back to that. I think we do... Evangelicals can do some funny things with that. So do, so do liberals do some funny things with that. Um, I, I will not... I, I will come back to that. All right. Love God with our heart, soul, strength, and mind. 
Those are not body parts, right? I think Jesus' message, those, are, those words are synonyms for everything you have. Hook, line, and sinker. I guess hook, line, and sinker would be a good phrase today. Do you think if Jesus said, I want you to go into this with both feet, we would have homilies on left foot jumping, little toe, left foot, next toe, little foot. We'd, we'd dissect it, right? If he said jumping with both feet, or if he said hook, line, and sinker, we'd have homilies on hooks, lines, and sinkers. But really, they mean they all mean the same thing, right? When you say both feet, hook, line, and sinker, these are... Um, sorry? Yes, I think Jesus is saying something like this. First greatest command is, love God with everything you have. And in case I, you missed my point, love God with everything you have. And in case you're still missing it, love God with everything you have. And let me summarize my first point. Love God with everything you have. And the second point, and both these commands are very radical. Um, radical is a good word for me. I'm from the 60s. Um, love God with everything you have. It's radical. Because he wants everything. And then he says... Love your neighbor as yourself. What do you think the most radical part of that is? Pardon? Love your neighbor is radical enough. What about the as yourself part? It's like, Lord, how can I do that? It's like impossible, right? How can I love my neighbor as much as I love myself? Well, the reason I cite Luke is because the lawyer makes a a tactical error here in the debate. And he says, seeking to justify himself, he says, who's my neighbor? And only in Luke, Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now remember, it's the Samaritan who's the winner in the story. To tell, to tell the thing, to say, the, to say it the way we could say it today, the Arab stops to help the Jew when the Jewish religious leaders pass them by. Of course, the Jewish religious leaders do pass them by in the parable. But the Arab stops to help them. Right? Because it has to be radical to get the Samaritan to stop. And Jesus sends with the words, 1037, go and do thou likewise. This is the second greatest command. The first greatest command is to love God with everything you have. Second, second greatest command it's to love others as yourself. Now notice, I say others instead of neighbor. Notice the guy who, in the parable of the Good Samaritan, that guy wasn't his neighbor. Right? In fact, it was a group that you shouldn't have anything to do with. I mean, what I, my comment there meant, don't think I'm saying you've got three people on either side of you, you've got to take care of those three people and you're off the hook with everybody else. Because it's the guy who, he finds them on the highway that he helps. Now, if you're going to major in one of these, I think evangelicals are, are correct to major in number one. And so it's sort of like we've got the donkey by the head and the liberals have the donkey by the tail, right? They've got the second one. And it's often true that liberals are very, very bad at the first point. And it's often true that we're very, very bad at the second point. And Jesus has the two of them going together. This is the second command. Now, you guys know by now I'm a big sports fan. If there are, say, 300 teams in the NCAA, any, any, any pool, and you're the number two team in the nation, you're Villanova in basketball, you're wishing you were Duke. I mean, not, you're not wishing you were Duke, but you wish you were number one. But yet, there are 298 other teams that wish they could be Villanova or Duke. What I mean is, the only one who looks up from number, the only one for whom number one isn't good enough probably is number two. Because two is pretty high. Seems to me Jesus is saying, this command is greater than all other commands, except this one. But I'm thinking evangelicals don't put this up there. Now how, I'll just make a comment here about how evangelicals go after this and how liberals go after this. In principle, I think Jesus has a one-two ethic. First God, and then others. 
I think it's clearly a one-two ethic because Jesus numbers it. In Matthew and Mark, he says, number one, this is the second greatest command. Jesus has a one-two ethic. Now, with this being one and this being two, evangelicals today probably have a, I'll come back to this, a one-one hundred. I mean, this one just doesn't rank up there with the average. If you go to a church where this is number two, I think it's a very rare evangelical church. Now, liberals come on the scene, and they conflate the two. And they say, no, by doing this, you're doing this. So you find God in your neighbor. So I think liberals either have a 2-1 ethic, or a 2-0 oh ethic, or a 2-question mark ethic. I, I don't know what it is, but they, they conflate these two so that it goes like this. And, by the way, if you, want, if you want to know, how come everybody's going to heaven, if there's a heaven, and a liberal ethic? Why is everybody, how are you going to get there? Because if you're doing this, you get this thrown in for free. Right? It's because it's a 2-1 or a 2-0 or a 2 question mark. They think you're doing it with this one. But now, Sean made a comment a moment ago. I think the most convicting verses in the Bible... We all have our most convicting verses. Two that I think are really, really rough. Luke 14.33, Unless a man forsake all that he hath, he can not be my disciple. Notice what Jesus doesn't say. He doesn't say, willing to forsake all. Now, we can play around with this one. This is tough. He says, when you invite people out to dinner, don't invite your friends. They might repay you. Invite people who can't repay you, and you'll be repaid at the resurrection of the just. 1 John 3, 16 to 18. We love him because he first loved us. If you see somebody on your doorstep, and the old King James word is naked, but the Greek word for naked there means improperly clothed, given the circumstances. You know, he's in a t-shirt and shorts and it's the middle of winter. Just doesn't have clothes to wear. And John says, you see somebody standing on your porch who's without the proper needs. And you have those needs. And you say, peace, be warned and filled. And don't clothe him how can the love of God abide in you? John asks. You know how Craig Blomberg translates that verse? I don't know if there's an applied negative there. It's not in the Greek. It's not like 1 Corinthians 12.31 where Paul says, not all speak with tongues, do they? Not all, not all, not all. And there's a specific, there's a negative term there, not all. But 1 John, Craig Blomberg translates, I need to ask him sometime where he got the translations, but he translates it this way. If somebody shows up on your doorstep and they have and they have needs and you have the ability to replace those or to give them those needs and you don't, the love of God does not abide in you. That's how Blomberg translates that. Now I don't think it's a two-one ethic. It's sort of like asking you the question: Does James two disagree with uh, Ephesians two? I think it's one of those. And I think. I think there's, I think James is making the point. I think the classical, I remember my Greek seminar, my fourth Greek class, we had to exegete a passage, and I picked James too, way back in the old days. I think the interpretation is right, that what James is not saying you're saved in any way by works. James says, you prove it without your works, and I'll prove it by my works. You show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. True faith works. He didn't say you're saved by works. I think John's after that too. And I think Paul says that. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. You're not saved by works. What's Ephesians 2, 10 say? We quit quoting after 9. Pardon? Okay, we are in workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. We're not saved by good works. I tell my students, it's a matter of a preposition. We're not saved by good works. 
we're saved unto good works. Anyway, I don't have time to pack, unpack this all tonight, but I think if I were going to talk about two things Jesus said, two of the main things, two of the most incredible topics to try to unpack are kingdom of God, present and future aspects, and how do we line up what Jesus calls the two greatest commands. And I'm just really convicted. I will not budge one iota from traditional evangelical theology, which says number one is always number one. It's got nothing to do with good works. It's got nothing to do with anything you do. It's got nothing to do with anything you have in your own power. Nothing. But the New Testament does say over and over again, it's not just James 2. It's Ephesians 2.10. It's 1 John 3. A troubling passage. Or Luke 14.33. Unless a man forsake all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Why? Are you saying you're saved by works? No, that's the same Luke. It's Jesus. But it's the same Luke who's recorded this. So this will issue into this. Now I do think there are people who have this and don't have this. I think Paul described one of those persons in, in 1 Corinthians 3. A person who all his works are burned up. He will be saved, Paul says. By the way, there's a really neat contrast in the Greek. There's a really neat contrast in 1 Corinthians 3 between, between the gift and the wages. Which I think is like more about this. Um, I hope we'll have time to get to it. But I think there's a contrast between salvation by grace, and we could have a disagreement about this, there's a disagreement among evangelicals, but I believe the Bible teaches, um, I'll use my sentence, I think the Bible teaches that everything you do with Christ after salvation determines the capacity to which you will enjoy eternity. In other words, the commonly what's called levels. The old word is rewards. So I think that's the contrast. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. You're not saved by works, you're saved by grace. But you're, you're saved unto good works. But if you don't have the works, I think where these guys are going, whether it's James, John, or Paul, Jesus, how about you'll know them by the fruits? I got Jesus, you got the... Who hasn't checked in here? We need Peter. And we'll have the big four. We'll have the big four of the, the apostles. James, Peter, John, Paul. Um, sounds like a couple popes, doesn't it? I think what they say is, you're not saved by works, by a mile. But if you don't have the works, somebody might question whether you ever... Now, you could do it without works. First Corinthians 3 says that happens. But if somebody doesn't see that, they can legitimately wonder what's going on with you. It, it's, I guess the only thing I'm leaving you with is, this always needs to stay number one. Always, always, always. And Jesus, I think this is where evangelicals are correct. It's about the kingdom, previous passage, and where your heart, soul, strength, and mind is. But here's my question for evangelicals. How come number two truly isn't number two with us? I don't know how there's any evangelicals whose who number two is loving others. Now, I know number two is not number one, but number two is ahead of everything else. I never hear that. I never hear that from the pulpit. In fact, when I was first growing up, if you were to say anything like this, when Carl Henry first came on the scene, a strong inerrantist, you guys know, know about Carl Henry. He passed away, didn't he? A few years ago? Yeah. When he was alive, he was called the Dean of Evangelical Theologians. When Carl Henry was first did some stuff like this in the late 1940s, early 1950s, he was called a Neo-Evangelical. You know how you got to be Neo? This sounded to them like social gospel. He wrote a book on the social responsibility of evangelical. And basically the response was, is there? Is there any? What are you, liberal? Here's how you stay evangelical. You always keep number one, number one. You never let number two slide over to number one. 
I'm always leery by students who say, in confronting our neighbor, we're, we're confronting God. If you're not careful, that becomes, like I said, it becomes a 2-1 or a 2-0 or a 2 question mark. And then do-gooding becomes the gospel. So I think the answer is you always keep number one, number one. But my challenge is, for an errantist who never sweep anything under the carpet, my two, the two lessons on the main thing under what Jesus said, what happened to the present aspect of the kingdom, and for those of you who were raised in churches where it was, I don't know where it was for me, I never heard it. But where's the present aspect of the kingdom? And secondly, where's our responsibility to others? Which Jesus said, that you could argue there's two greatest messages. The kingdom of God, how to get there, and the one two ordering of our priorities. Okay, well I spent way too long on this. So I'm going to make up for it by doing nothing with it. No. It's not that bad. All right. Let's talk about did, and that'll be a good time to take our break. And then we can uh, go for the big finish here. Uh, what are we? Roman rule four. What did Jesus do? Well, going back to our list of criteria, I mentioned some things to you. What's one of the things he taught? What's, how, what are some of his teachings? Well, he had conflict with the religious leaders of his day. Well, some of his actions are conflict, too. Jesus had acted out. There's not just a spoken conflict, there's the acted conflict. Um, of course, forcibly, it turns out, if you really want to take this to, you know, its ultimate conclusions, they crucified him. That's a did. That's a did prompted by him running a aground of both the civil authority and the religious authorities, the Romans and the uh, Jews. He had conflict. Here's another one. He and his disciples were called Sabbath breakers. Or maybe just plain law breakers. What did he and his disciples do? He a Sabbath breaker or a law breaker. Do you remember some of the things they did? Pardon? He healed on the Sabbath. What else? They ate. Remember the disciples picked the grain and they were preparing the food on the Sabbath. Pardon? Was that on the Sabbath? That's Mark 2. Yeah, I don't know if it's the one in... Um, that could be the one in Mark 2. I don't remember it being on the Sabbath, that one. But if there's a, that's not the only account where that happened. A few days later, when he entered Capernaum. That's what it said. Um, oh, but he did tell people. Remember he talked about the ox falling into the ditch on the Sabbath? What else? Showed him to be a... Showed conflict. Preparing the food. Pardon? Ate with publicans and sinners. How about didn't wash his hands? Disciples didn't wash his hands before they ate. And Jesus comes down on them and says, you, you know, I think we have a view of sin today that's like the Pharisees. I think the Pharisees had a view like sin was superficial. It's like dirt on your skin. You take a shower and it's gone. And Jesus said, wait a minute. You don't wash your hands to get rid of sin. Sin is something that hatches in your heart and it comes out. And by the time you've spoken it, it's already done its damage. I haven't read this book, but um, which of Frank Peretti's books is it where the guy's chest rock? Their, their chest rock? Is that the old or the prophet? Or? It's the second one. This present darkness, piercing the darkness? I should tell you guys a real quick Frank Freddy story. I had a speaking engagement a few years ago in Colorado Springs. 
I asked my wife, I always ask my wife if she wants to go. I, I can't, I, I get tired of going speaking gates by myself, that's another story. I try to get her to go whenever I can. She didn't really want to come. She thinks Colorado is the prettiest state in the U.S., but that was enough to get her on the plane. I said, hey, it's a big conference. Maybe you want to hear one of the other speakers. I mean, you know, you do it all at once. You have to listen to me. Well, who are the other speakers? I got this far. Frank Peretti. She goes, give me a ticket. <laughs> Frank Peretti is her favorite, favorite author. So we actually ended up having a few meals. I was at another engagement with him, and we ended up having a few meals with he and his wife. And my wife thinks it's the highlight of her life was meeting Frank Peretti and having him sign her books. Frank Peretti's a nut. <laughs> yes. I tell some Frank Freddy stories. He's just, the last time we were together, I was sitting at my book table. I was behind the book table. And this guy walked up to me, and I was just putting my books out. And the guy came to me and said, that was the first part. Uh, this is not the point of my story. This is always, this is never the point of my story. But the guy said, oh, Dr. Hermes, I read your stuff and apologize. Can I get a picture with you? Okay. I don't say this because of me. You'll see where it's coming. I said, I guess. The guy came around behind the table. <laughs> He's put his arm up my shoulder and he asked this person to take a picture. Right when they're starting to take a picture, Frank Freddy walks by. And Frank goes like this. Oh! Oh, <laughs> And the guy got Frank for free. <laughs> That's Frank. Anyway, his second book, I think it's Piercing the Darkness. Guys are rotted from the inside out. And by the time it comes out, it's too late. They're already... And I think that's what Jesus... I think that's a biblical view of sin. It rots from the inside out. So some scary things that come from this. Skin always, sin always leaves a scar. Sin is habit forming. It's always easier to sin a second time. And a tenth time. Anyway, here's some thoughts on sin. But that stuff wasn't popular when Jesus said it. They thought more superficially. Wash your hands. Don't prepare the food in the sack. So those are some things he did. Here's the big category under what did Jesus do. Some of these are things we talked about last night in the manifestation and so on. Here's the big one. Today, it's pretty much unanimous that Jesus was a miracle worker. He did miracles. Now, when I think about miracles, I think about two kinds. Healings, we talked about them briefly last night. Nature. The critical scholars add a third. I mentioned it last night. Do you remember what it was? I, exorcisms. I never heard that put in the miracle group when I was growing up or going to school. The critics, oh well, it's supernatural. I don't know. Object. The critics talk, talk about these three. Uh, you know what? You'll see why I'm going to do this in a minute. I'm going to call this B. And nature miracles are just going to move down. Critics today say that Jesus was a miracle worker in at least those first two senses. If somebody's going to doubt one of the categories, it's this one. You know why? You get a feeling they doubt the third one because it's the most miraculous category. You say, wait a minute. Are you telling me Rudolf Boltmann, Reginald Fuller at all? Are you telling me they thought Jesus did miracles? No, I'm not telling you that. Yeah, but you just said... All right, let me tell you what they're saying and what they're not saying. I don't think very many of these guys would die critical scholars would die for Jesus really doing miracles. Here's what they say. You have to watch the words real carefully. Situations in the Gospels that describe A and B. Things happen in history that would fulfill those two categories. You go, did anything supernatural happen? Much of the time they'll just say no. Marcus Borg says we can't be sure. It could have. Should I pause, Carl? Two minutes. We're doing a tape break.
and we'll be ready for our real break here.